Hey everybody, what's going on? It is episode 140 of Fishery, and you guys make this all happen. If you guys want to support this and what I'm doing by reporting on the newest news in ecology, freshwater, uh, biology, archaeology, history, and everything new or old in our hobby uh, that's academically uh, reviewed or big in the news, uh, you can support this channel and these segments by becoming a member for only $1.99 a month. I couldn't even make it cheaper. I wish it was $0.99. Cents. But all of that really helps because it allows me to spend hours and hours researching and to focus on answering questions, making the other content on the channel. And honestly, uh, this is what I love to do, so I have to thank you all for it. Now, today what I want to talk about, and in fact all this week, is a little more laid back than some of the uh, fishery episodes, but as always, it will be audio-based, so uh, I'm not going to be showing anything on screen that you have to be watching. You can do your water changes or drive to work or whatever it may be. And I hope that that is helpful, that we have a segment set up like that, or uh, that it's in podcast form uh, if you want to listen to it that way. But today what I want to talk about is an article that one of my viewers sent me, and it happens to fit in Chef's Kiss beautifully with something I already wanted to talk about in one of these episodes, which is industrial melanism. And uh, what is that? Well, that is in nature when animals that generally camouflage or that use colors uh, in nature for signaling and for survival are either not allowed to reproduce the way they would naturally, uh, wildly, due to human inputs of pollution, or they're not able to survive with their camouflage as it is. And so over time, they become selected for uh, being darker or being looking. So for instance, if there's soot coming out of a factory and all the trees in the area have a layer of uh, black ash on them, the, the, the moss and other things that turn darker, all the animals that live in there that are of a darker hue, that have more melanin, just like we do in our skin, uh, making some people darker and some people lighter, uh, they will survive longer because they aren't seen by predators. The predators would see a white moth on a black tree. And it is this exact uh, example of moths, in fact, the peppered moth, on a birch tree outside of London, England, that first sparked this uh, being noticed. And it was coined industrial melanism at the time because there was so much smog and soot during uh, the textile revolution and industrial revolution in London that they were burning coal and running steam engines at such a rate that, I, I mean, it was hard to breathe. People would die when there was bad smog days then. And that fine layer of ash and carbon co coated everything and lichen as well as moss as well as tree bark was coated and an owl and bird species that normally ate all these moths uh, these moths counted on lichen being kind of a peppered color or a white color uh, or the white whitish color tannish color of birch trees well it turns out that the ones that stood out, they got eaten all of a sudden, and so all that was left in that area that was affected by the pollution was dark moths. Now here's the crazy 21st century twist. It turns out that melanin plays a role in detoxifying, or at least in allowing animals to survive at higher rates, in radioactive environments as well as heavy metal environments, which is really interesting because if you think about it, uh, evolutionarily, maybe they've been exposed to fires or volcanic eruptions, maybe even meteor impacts, who knows? But by chance, the same thing that makes them dark so they don't get eaten by predators also allows them to tolerate those darker conditions that are created in nature by fire and things. So it's almost like, did it evolve that way? Is it a coincidence? 
And the answer is right now, we just don't know. But I have some new interesting cases of it that have been in the news recently. And by news, I mean academic journals, because, uh, yeah, this is some nerdy stuff. But apparently the frogs in Chernobyl, this is the article that was sent to me by a viewer, Amy, uh, and they have realized that the frogs in the radioactive zone around Chernobyl get darker and darker black uh, until they're totally melanistic frogs. Now, this isn't a frog that's normally brown sometimes and then green others or whatnot. This is a green pond and tree frog that has been green all throughout Europe and uh, Central Asia. And around Chernobyl, where the, radio, where the radiation is higher than normal, it is black. And the closer you get to the epicenter of the radiation in the ponds and forests there, the blacker the frogs get. Yet they seem to be surviving, if not thriving, in this uh, environment. Now, obviously, too high of radiation is too high, and any uh, creature will die at some point. But the study that they're trying to do right now is to determine... How is it that that melanin, that the melanism, uh, industrial melanism, is actually helping them with the toxicity of the environment? Like, what is that? It's almost too good to be true, right? Um, because humans are such a new thing, and our uh, pollution is such a new thing. Is it that they're able to, uh, like the moth, is it just maybe luck that it happened to be soot? and carbon and they could withstand higher levels of soot and carbon also or is it selection that's also going on separate from being eaten or not eaten or is it dumb luck and with this we're starting to find more and more cases where it appears it's not dumb luck so here's another example on christmas island as well as reunion island uh, which is a french territory or former french overseas territory they also found that there were sea snakes that tended to be uh, banded colors, like white and gray and black. And these snakes have turned completely black in the region where they've been mining for around 80 years on one of the main parts of Christmas Island, which is uh, kind of off the coast of Australia, uh, due uh, northwest towards India. Uh, and uh, or or Thailand or Malaysia, I suppose. And uh, these snakes, these sea crates, as they're called, they're now totally jet black all around that mining site where the coke, as it's called, from coal, uh, which is a black uh, type of chunk of coal, is being basically dumped into the sea. Also, there's graphene, graphite, carbon, and all these other compounds that are being found there and being kind of uh, set aside. And some of the things are being used, some of them aren't. But the other thing that's happened is that uh, with finding uh, metals there, such as nickel and uh, tin, they have now been doing strip mining and putting that fill that's high in those other elements that are that are being uh, looked for. They're just throwing that uh, off the coast and basically building a little bit of new land with it or just trying to get rid of it into the ocean, dumping it off the coast. And it has actually led to higher than normal by, I think it's like a hundredfold at this point, uh, heavy metal levels in the animals there. Well, the snakes that happen to be all black, which don't have a ton of predators anyways, are all black. And so uh, they're all black and they're dealing with the, uh, sorry, I just said something, that that was a bit redundant, but the, the snakes that are all black, they're handling these heavy metals better. So it's not just radioactivity, it's also heavy metals. So chicken or the egg, did they evolve to handle these heavy metals uh, like lead and mercury, uh, did they, they evolve during this process of also trying to blend in with all this black stuff being put into the ocean? Or did it coincide with the melanism? And yet again, you know, frogs, sea snakes, uh, birds, we've seen it in a lot of different species. And it's just really interesting to see what's going on. And we don't have a clear answer yet. But there are some interesting ways in which melanin is actually thought to be uh, protective, not against 
just radiation from the sun, but radiation of all kinds. And so its properties are being re-examined as we speak by a bunch of different teams from all over the world to see if there's anything that this could be applied to uh, in our other types of engineering and industrial design. Sorry about the sirens, guys. I'm back home in Seattle, so what am I gonna? What what can I do about it? Anyhow, I had a great time in uh, Chicago and Florida. Sorry about the delay in the episodes, but I'm back, and uh, the rest of the episodes this week, I'll make the next one a little shorter since this one was a little longer. Thanks for sticking with me, and uh, if you're watching on the Aquatic Morning Show, back to you, Jess. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Hey guys, what is going on? It is fishery with an exclamation point on the secret history living in your aquarium. We've got episode 141 and boy have I got a fishy story to tell you guys today. So this came out the other day and I kind of giggled and uh, shrugged and thought, well, people suck and uh, that's kind of comical. Turns out the issue was a lot bigger than first glance appeared that the issue was. So what am I talking about? Well, what I'm talking about is uh, the walleye fishing competition uh, in Lake Erie. So there was a fishing competition that's held annually, and everybody paid $500 to be a part of it. And then they raised a bunch of money for charity and local food banks. And then $30,000 of that money... Uh, raised by some, I think it was 70 teams of two people on each team, uh, then goes into the prize pot, 30,000 of it, or uh, technically I think it's 28,500 or something, uh, goes to the winners, uh, you know, another 10 or 15 goes to second place and on so on and so forth down the line uh, through some of the rankings, and then the other half or more goes to charity, uh, as well as all the fish that are caught, are then filleted and given to charity. Well, apparently for the last few years, there is a team that has been doing just so phenomenally well that people had been talking, there had been rumors going around that these people in this one fishing boat team were cheating somehow. And the names of uh, Kaminsky and Runyon came up a bunch of times in different tournaments all over the Midwest and the uh, kind of the northeastern uh, part of the U.S., but the westernmost part of that. So kind of the Great Lakes and Midwest uh, through Pennsylvania into Ohio and, and all the way down to the Mississippi. And these guys have been entering contests for over a decade. They've even been on outdoor TV and sportsman angler shows, and I'm sure that you guys have heard by now, just even if you're not into fishing as a sport, which I'm not into following any of that, but um, I understand the the fun in managing a fishery and uh, doing like derby style fishing and trying to see who can catch the most fish and all that. And uh, it turns out that these guys were putting weights, lead weights, inside their fish. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard that much. Well, doing some more investigation, uh, the Washington Post, as well as the New York Times, decided to dig a little deeper uh, based on some Reddit posts by other anglers that had been posted way before this saying that those guys were cheaters and in fact they'd been disqualified from one competition recently and uh, the 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 one guy Kaminsky he left all the way before uh, the weights were literally cut out of the fish at the weigh-in so their team was at this final weigh-in where they were going to announce the winners before this whole crowd of anglers and the friends and family and uh, non-profit and charity group hosts that are a part of this event every year, this walleye catch. And uh, as they weighed these fish, the winning team uh, of the day had like 16.39 pounds that they had added to their total that had been a running total of this event. And they had, I think, seven or eight fish that they had caught. Well, in four or five fish, these guys came over small fish, not, not huge fish, they were small to medium fish, yet somehow on the scale when the weigh-in time came, 
they weighed 33 pounds. Yet, there were less of them, and they were smaller than the second place at this point, after the weigh-in. And the judge, who has the last name Fisher, not spelled like a fisherman, but with the S-C-H, uh, knew immediately that something was off, that, that there were weights, or that the scale was off, or that there was ice, or something was going on. And in the past, they've actually had people cheat by stashing pre-caught fish that are frozen uh, underwater and having scuba divers put them on the hook. They've had people um, lie about, you know, how long they've been fishing, like have someone fishing early in the morning, catch some fish and hand them off. You name it, someone has probably cheated uh, somehow in that competition or competitions like it. And so these big ones, they actually say, I will take a polygraph or a lie detector test uh, to defend my claims. Uh, it's that serious. And they'll have an actual ex-law uh, enforcement, federal law enforcement agent read the polygraph. So as all this is going on at the weigh-in, people know obviously by watching any fisherman who knows the fish knows that that's a five pound fish not a, a not an 11 pound fish or whatever these were you know ringing up as on the digital scale there and so as they got their total and it was being read out and it was kind of basically the uh mr fisher had to act like well this is the winner as far as we know right this second uh the crowd started swearing, and Kaminsky, he takes off, he gets out of there and disappears. Well, Runyon stays there and is kind of holding tight, fighting, you know, saying, like, I caught these fish fair and square. So the judge pulls out a fillet knife, and in front of the crowd, he pulls out the lead weight. And uh, that's what led to all of this. And the crowd almost tear tore the guy apart. People are wanting to... Uh, charge this guy with fraud, with uh, embezzlement. I mean, they, they're thinking of anything they can because they want to charge these guys with theft, basically, for entering this contest. Well, when the other New York Times and Washington Post and local uh, journalists and, and uh, sports writers and things looked into it, they found that they've won almost $800,000 in winnings in the last decade, these two guys. And that they, uh, you know, they kind of had a bad name and they had an outdoor fishing show go with them and clear their name by showing them catch a fish, weigh the fish, catch a fish, weigh the fish during one of these competitions. And after that, uh, you know, the, the people were a little more satisfied that, okay, maybe these guys are good fishermen. And everyone out there is in like a hundred thousand dollar boat, totally decked out for fishing. These are serious fishermen. And those boats that they happened to be in, both Runyon and Kaminsky, each got a hundred and fifty and a hundred and forty thousand dollar fishing boat, sports fishing boat, you know, just totally decked out to the nines from prior competitions. So now it's coming into question what other competitions did they cheat in? How many did they cheat? And are there going to be ways to prove it? And uh, will polygraphs hold up? And all sorts of things. But I did check with a biologist, and they said that it is possible that a fish may swallow a lead weight if it were suspended in water or covered in some sort of something that smells good or on a line and they accidentally swallow the line. Uh, however, a fish will not eat multiple weights of lead uh, off the ground or anything like that, let alone the chances of multiple fish doing it. So just so we can check reality here, uh, yeah, these guys were caught super red-handed. So I know that doesn't sound like the biggest deal in the world, and to me it's not, but in the fishing world, in the sports fisherman world, whoa, this was the biggest story so far of 2022 for Google, for Yahoo, and for Bing. I don't know who uses Bing. Let me know in the comments if you do. But uh, <laughs> for all the search engines, this was the biggest story related to fish or fishing uh, for the year so far. And we're almost done with the year. So, uh, And it was like by a long shot. So uh, this thing is kind of going crazy. And I could see them making 
a comedy movie out of this or something someday. But uh, let me know if you know more about it or if I'm missing any info, because uh, it's unfolding rapidly. But uh, seems kind of silly, but it's also not so funny when you think about it being for charity and all the other people who pay money and, you know, equip themselves and go out and take this seriously. A lot of the country, maybe not where you live, or maybe it is where you live, take this very seriously. It's like a national pastime for them in, in a lot of areas. So that's the story. And uh, it's a fishing one at that. I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye. Hey everybody, what is going on? It's Alexander Williamson. I think you know that by now. And we are talking fishery, and I think you know that by now. So, uh, episode 142? Yeah, 142. So, thanks for sticking around. Today, I'm happy to announce that a company that I have worked with... Uh, for a long time in one way. So Aquatic Arts is a company that has led the internet in a lot of uh, selling tank rays, uh, domestic US bred fish, even oddball fish and plecos and quarries and things like that that oftentimes are all imported, especially if you're getting it from an online retailer. They have led the way in having breeding facilities or having breeders that they pay and it fairly pay at that uh, they give them a good price higher than a lot of what you would see on the wholesale market coming out of Asia Southeast Asia and uh, comparable to what you see in Florida off the fish farms maybe even a little higher uh, as well as they've bred their own shrimp lines and they've expanded in the last year, which was a little bumpy for them. So Aquatic Arts, which this company that uh, I found about six years ago now, and they were just selling shrimp and a few other things at the time. Now they sell all sorts of fish and they've grown to almost two dozen employees. And uh, this company is now branching out and their owner has basically stepped back and said, I want to start another company. And this new company that is going to have a lot of the same philosophies, such as the philanthropy, giving back, you know, teachers or tanks, if you adopt a pet, they give you $50 credit for their store, no strings attached. Aquatic Arts has done that for years, which is incredible, unheard of, uh, as well as giving, you know, prizes away and uh, always having good customer service. By the way, if you ever experience anything different, or if someone says that, please track down who it is, what happened, and tell them to talk to me. Because uh, following these things down, I have never seen a situation where they didn't make it right, or more so, you know, like replacing all the fish and giving them a gift card, or sending a new batch of fish and more, or whatnot. So that's why I work with them, along with the fact that they won't import things or buy things or carry things like the red-tailed catfish or like a fish that is endangered and not coming from, you know, captive bred conditions. Like, for instance, some of the uh, newer and more beautiful in the last 10, 15 years, little rasboras that we all want to buy and that are easy to sell all day long, they're no longer selling because unless it's tank rays, they're not going to sell wild caught types of these fish because they're under threat and just because their country of origin has not listed them as threatened or the IUCN hasn't gotten around to listing them as threatened doesn't mean that they aren't and so they do their research and they put out care guides and uh, they're there to assist so they want to take that to an all new level and they're opening a company that I was uh, hired freelance to do graphic design for as that they needed, you know, I, I have this working relationship where you guys know you can get 15% off anything at Aquatic Arts, free dry shipping, by using my code. And my code changes every month, uh, or every two months now. And just go to my newest video, it's always in the description. Uh, when you click the little drop down description, it's there or pinned in the comments. There'll be what the newest code is. Uh, as it changes, if you're watching old videos, it may not be current. That That's why I do that uh, in my latest video. So they're starting this company called Vivi that's going to be online fish selling, fish buying, fish breeding. And the idea is literally they want to put aquatic arts out of business. Even though the owner funded this, 
put a lot of money on the line, like half the company basically on the line uh, or more to build it right. And it's been being built behind the scenes for almost two years now uh, through testing and, and development and all sorts of other things. But they have actually gone through and listed like 9,000 species of freshwater fish and saltwater fish and invertebrates that would be in the hobby. They're adding care guides to those. They're taking all of the knowledge that aquatic arts had uh, on info sheets and research that is done. And it's not just copy and pasted. It's researched well. They actually have a head aquarist, Matt, who happens to be a friend of mine now, uh, that goes in depth and actually looks these things up uh, from the papers that are published on where they're collected or when the species is listed. If that doesn't exist, then it's you know checked with as many sources as possible outside the U.S. and in. So it's not just a regurgitation of old stuff. Same with their photos. Their photos on aquatic arts were traditionally great. And so they want the same for this Vivi site. And also on this Vivi site, they want to allow, even if you want to sell, you, you uh, breed five Celestial Pearl Danios and you want to sell them from uh, Oregon to Georgia, you can do that. And uh, you can sell them right now on their site. Uh, and you can sign up at vivvy.com. You can also buy those five uh, if you want. So it's going to dictate whatever price those wholesalers were selling to Aquatic Arts. Now they can list direct to the public. And Aquatic Arts is going to take 12.5%. Uh, I think it gets rounded up to 15 with the credit card transaction company stuff. Um, if I'm, I could be wrong on that. But in any case, so for 15% of the total end cost say normally aquatic arts pays them three dollars for an angelfish list the angelfish for ten dollars on their website or nine dollars on their website now these people are going to be able to sell those angelfish for nine dollars on the website or whatever aquatic arts was selling them for give vivi who's the same owner so in the end it'll he'll still get his uh money essentially uh but that's 15 percent instead you know so 15 percent of nine bucks whatever that ends up being a buck or something uh you know ascend let's just say 10 bucks so then uh we can say it's a dollar 50 that gets taken out so 850 goes to the owner of those of those fish instead of getting the three bucks wholesale so if they can source buyers they can sell and make way more money so this is hopefully going to encourage a whole lot more of domestic breeding of oddballs of high-end fish of low and fish too but anybody in the u.s who's doing it um with their uh cr criteria for ethics and standards which is all laid out on their site and everything can join and you can also join even if you're not selling fish if you just want to buy fish potentially or if you just want to share like for instance a biotope tank or an aquascape they have this cool setup and the whole site runs on the idea that you set up sort of a LinkedIn page or a MySpace page like back in the day for each of your tanks. So if you want, you can set up uh, a profile with nothing and just go buy stuff or you can set up uh, a space for each tank. So for me, I've got a lake inlay tank and I've got all the fish that are in there, the plants that are in there. And then there's hyperlinks to that and info on those, plus any info I want to give. And as ch time goes on, you can put new inputs and it will essentially like graph out or give you a timeline of, oh, the pH changed. Oh, the TDS changed or whatever it may be. And you can actually get a feedback on what it is you're doing, maybe where something changed, where the breeding got better or worse. And so they're hoping that by using these new interactive tools in the future too, like Inkbird or other uh, companies where you can plug in like a heater and it gives data and things like that, that they'll be able to basically arrange that and articulate that. Uh, it's not quite to that point yet, but they're open to any of your ideas of how we can make fish keeping more fun for one and more uh shareable more so information can be shared that's good quality information like 
I keep these 10 fish together in a community tank and they get along great. Oh, the barbs were snippy, so I took them out. Well, then it notices, oh, barbs are out of the mix after being in there. Well, maybe there was an issue. Take note of that. Maybe 40 people do that out of 10,000 people with profiles, and maybe there's something triggered that says, hey, I think these barbs don't get along with neon tetras and yada yada. So there's a lot of potential there, and it's going to be all anonymized, so there's no one person that's going to get that info. But in the future, they'll be able to set up uh, basically kind of AI, uh, but it's not, you know, heavy thinking AI. It's more just like you could give it a task to look through all the profiles on the site and look for trends. And so the more info you put on the site, uh, yes, in theory, someone could look at that, but they are not using it for marketing whatsoever. So if you put your info on there, Aquatic Arts isn't going to get it, uh, and neither is Vivi. But it does allow you to create things like wish lists and waiting lists. So if you have a male pleco and you need a green dragon female pleco that you want to cross because you only have short fins, you can add that to your wish list. And as soon as the seller has it, boom, you'll be notified and you'll be shipped. Now, starting out right now, all shipping overnight because for animal welfare, they won't do it slow on the ground. And I know that there's some plants and fish that might be better shipped that way uh, on the ground, like shrimp or something. It might be fine. But because of the death of these animals and them wanting a general rule and streamline system, uh, other than dry scape, which might be dealt with differently later, everyone on the site is going to get $25 shipping for like basically the medium flat rate box is about the size it'll ship. So about six bags of fish can be overnighted for $25 if you sign up. So killer deal for selling fish or for buying fish. I don't know anywhere where the shipping's that cheap. Everywhere I go, it's $50 to $80 for me to order a few different types of fish and have them overnighted, which is usually the only option. So I want you guys to check out Vivi. If, if, uh, see if it's worth your while. Go to their community tab. Uh, see what pages are on there. You can check out my page. You can see what I did with my aquariums uh, and how I'm kind of have a breeding aquarium. I have my biotope aquariums. I have some of my aquascapes and I've got some of my deep stub straights and non, uh, non-filtered non tanks. And I'm just trying to share the info on it. So now when someone asks me like what's wrong with their tank, if they had this ready, I could look at all the plants and stuff and I could be like, oh, did you use this fertilizer differently? because of these plants or uh, you know six months ago the pictures of that tank look quite different I can see that the the top of your tank has become overgrown uh, maybe there's not enough oxygen and gas exchange going on on the surface of your tank so the 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 potential applications of this are really cool uh, not just for the company and not just for buying and selling fish but also just for sharing and expressing ourselves as fish keepers and I think it's cool because nothing quite as complex or or uh, as detailed as that exists yet. So check out vivi.com. It's free to sign up. The only thing that happens is if you sell stuff, they take that little commission and you get the, the, the crazy cheap shipping right now that um, I assume they're taking a loss on because I don't know how else they could be doing it right now. Uh, but that's the way it is for now until uh, the company grows and is at a point where... Uh, where they want it and then even then they're going to keep shipping they're going to negotiate as a giant group like a company would like amazon does uh and so the more of us that sign up the bigger uh bargaining we have essentially the more people that are buying selling fish so it's like the best of get gills and aquabed and all those other things plus if you're a local fish store or you're an online you know you're someone who sells like hundreds of bettas from your house or whatever it may be you're free to sign up too if you import and just kind of flip fish. As long as you're doing it by the ethical practices that they've okayed and laid out, you're allowed on there too. But it's going to all be transparent. That's the whole point of this thing is from A to B to C to D, but hopefully just A to B, uh, it'll be transparent. You know, you'll, you'll have to say these are uh, domestic bread, these are uh, bread here at my house in a tank, or these are not, and you'll upload a picture of the fish, and boom, that's the fish you're going to get or from that batch of babies. 
And so I'm really excited for this to take off. I hope big places like Wet Spot and stuff sign up. And uh, I think the more people that sign up, the more places will sign up inevitably. And uh, I just think then we'll have more power and more selection. And hopefully it gets real weird with the kind of fish we can buy. I know this has been a really long episode, but uh, I just am excited about it because I did the graphic design. I'm not in league with them in any other way other than them asking my input like, hey, what would you change about the hobby? What would you do uh, you know, to make things better? What do you hate most about selling fish? Um, what is the most expensive part of selling fish or buying fish? And so they've taken a lot of feedback from a lot of people and I'm one of those. So uh, also all the little fishy patterns and designs and wallpapers and uh, backdrops and the taxonomical art and all that, that's all uh, me and another gal, Michelle, did the creative design and the graphic design. I'm the, I was the graphic designer uh, on that. So uh, if you hate it, you can let me know. If you like it, you can let me know. But either way, it was a really fun project to work on. And hopefully I'll still be working on it if, uh, if it succeeds. So uh, yeah, that's the story and I'm sticking to it. Check out vivvy.com. It's free, it's cool, and it's like LinkedIn for your aquarium. Hey, you guys. It's Fishtory. Was that anticlimactic? Anyways, today on Fishtory, we're going to talk about something that's going on that could change the course of the hobby, but could change the course of climate and the world. So that is, who becomes president in Brazil? And uh, as of last week when I started writing this episode, uh, there was a lot of, uh, let's say, tension surrounding the Brazilian presidency run. The two candidates that are running are fairly different. In some ways, they're kind of the same also, though. Uh, it's kind of like the American parties. You know, there's a whole lot about them that's the same, but then there's certain key issues that are very different. Well, one of those issues is the development and utilization of the rainforest and damming of the rainforest and the Xingu River and um, other rivers in the Amazon, as well as using the land for cattle ranching or palm plantations or mining or you name it. And right now... Uh, the current president is very, very pro utilizing every inch of it. And in fact, uh, he's a very bombastic, outgoing person. Uh, he's, he's been called the Tropic Trump. Uh, so his personality is very pro-business and pro-nationalist. But he has the army on his side in his country. And he's going with the playbook of January 6th in that he's saying that the elections are going to be a fraud and that if he doesn't win by an, a margin of 60%, that they'll have to take him out with... Uh, he won't go peacefully, essentially. And he's making some pretty big claims. Now, a lot of people like that he loosened up regulations because, in theory, even though we haven't seen it happen yet... There are fish like the uh, like the L zero four six the uh, the zebra pleco that haven't been allowed to be exported in years now. That under Ibama, not a Obama, Ibama, uh, a treaty and group uh, basically that that uh, dictates what gets saved, imported, marked as threatened, marked as uh, protected. In the rainforest with all organisms and uh, also as well as, um, you know, woods and um, minerals and things, uh, has said that, no, those are, are they need to be protected. They, they only occur in certain places, certain rivers, and no, you can't export them. Well, Bolsonaro, the current president, he undid some of that. Granted, we haven't seen in the U.S., I haven't seen any Brazilian imports lately uh, of the fish that were, were delisted again. Uh, so I don't know what, what sort of enforcement on the ground has changed, but I do know that some fish keepers think that that's a good thing. Also, I do know that on the political spectrum, some people are into nationalism and into a strong military uh, guy who calls all the shots and has all the power. However, uh, Brazil also had a former leader who went by the name of Lula. 
And Lula was actually in charge from, I believe it was like 2003 to 2012 or something. Uh, I can't remember the exact dates, but he was in power for two terms. And uh, essentially, he was pro-union, um, a little bit to the left in that country, but he was still, I mean, he still okayed the building of dams, and under his watch, some of the worst deforestation uh, of the rainforest, the Amazon, did happen. In 2007, 6, 7, and 8, uh, farmers organized and burned a lot of the rainforest. However, uh, the current rate at which the, the, the current president is allowing it to happen is now much higher. So the rainforest under Bolsonaro uh, saw 30,000 fires in August of this summer lit intentionally to burn down the rainforest. So we're losing an area of Manhattan every month uh, of the, the dense rainforest uh, to these fires alone and then more of the second growth rainforest, that's untouched rainforest, but then five times that is getting burned down of overgrowth areas and things. And all that's going up into the air and affecting, you know, carbon, methane, all the different uh, greenhouse gases. But Lula is ahead now. So when I wrote this, I thought it would come out before the election, but he has won the first round by about, 10 points ahead of uh, Bolsonaro. However, Bolsonaro is saying that he would rather die or go to prison than to not become president again. And so it remains to be seen, since he has the military on his side, what's going to happen. Now, under Lula, even though there was a lot of destruction of the rainforest, it wasn't under his that wasn't his plan. That wasn't his ideology. It wasn't a pro-exploitation. And later he helped form a lot of laws and legislation that actually did end up protecting the rainforest and uh, rethinking some of the damming projects. Now, the interesting twist here is Lula has been sentenced or convicted, essentially, of stealing millions from the Brazilian people while he was president. So he was corrupt. Some people say the same is true of the guy in power now. Now, that is nothing new to Brazil and their politics, and uh, it's pretty common, actually, to see presidents stealing millions of dollars over the years. But uh, he was recently um, pardoned, essentially, or his name was cleared uh, by the Supreme Court of the country, which is a whole... I mean, these politics are a whole other thing. But now that he's ahead in the races, they have a runoff. And the way their system works is if nobody won by a clear literal majority of 51% or more, then they go to the top two winners and they vote again. And so now they're going to vote again. And uh, some people are worried about fixed ele rigged elections and things. And uh, quite, uh, you know, quite frankly, a lot of writers, including uh, ones at The Guardian, uh, The New York Times... And as well as places like Al Jazeera, um, you know, uh, Haratz out of Israel, uh, and even, you know, Tokyo. Uh, there are journalists from different parts of the world with all sorts of different agendas. And so, you know, you could say all sorts of bad things about either candidate, probably. But uh, the one thing that's clear is they know that if Bolsonaro remains in charge, the rainforest will pay. And, and, that may enrich the uh, Brazilian people as they mine the rainforest and they clear cut it and they burn it down and silt goes into the rivers. But it for sure means that a lot of species are going to keep going extinct. They're going to die. They're actually seeing because of the warming of the last 20 years or so that the places they've clear cut of the rainforest, even when they start to grow back, they grow back as basically a grassy savanna and not as that rich rainforest like they used to. So his claim just the other day was that the rainforest is just as healthy as it was in 1500 when the Spanish arrived, and not to worry that there's lots left to cut down and cut away, basically. 
So it's rather worrying uh, for those of us who care about the rainforest, which happens to be me. Now, I care about the Brazilian people as well, and I know there's lots of nuances to these issues. So if you have an opinion or extra thoughts about this uh, topic today, please put it in the uh, comments below. I'd love to hear your point of view, especially if you're living in Brazil or from Brazil. Now, the runoff uh, election is going to be on October 30th, and that's when we should know more about the fate of you know, the policy of Brazil and what's going to happen. So this is really big news and uh, has implications I can't get into in a short amount of time, but I want you guys to keep an eye out for it. Even though it's not our country or it may not be your country, uh, it's going to impact the world, both in resources coming out of the Amazon, but also in the, uh, the cleansing role that the Amazon plays in uh, the network of Saharan across to the Caribbean, hurricanes, trade winds, phosphorus, phosphates, and nitrates, uh, as well as the ocean flow uh, and the jet stream. All of that's tied in, and the moisture that falls and that is then held like a sponge in, in the rainforest. So it's not necessarily the entire world's climate uh, is impacted per se, but uh, some people would say that it is, and even the people who are the most conservative in the scientific world do say that it impacts a lot of the world's uh, climate uh, and meteorological as well as geological and biological systems. So it's really crucial to protect it as much as we can. That's where I'm going to leave you guys today. I know these were a long set of fish tree. Uh, but I'm shooting from the hip just what I read while I was traveling and so forth. And so you got a little bit of a longer, but a little more casual of a uh, read this week. So I'll talk to you guys next time. And thank you so very much for listening this far. If you made it all the way through, let's type the secret word gerbil because it's random uh, in a comment. Leave me the word gerbil. Uh, yeah. So how about that? And uh, if you're watching this on the Aquatic Morning Show, sorry these were all so long this week. Uh, I'll talk to you guys later. Much love to you all, and uh, back to you, Jess. Bye, guys.